After two storms damaged their flower farm, Neil and Jane Ho struggled to see a future in agriculture. Mr. Ho's, who was beaten, in debt, and had more than two decades of experience, thought farming was for fools. Tiago Barbosa knocked on their door a few years later in Tolga, southwest of Cairns, pitching a self-sustaining farming system. Is the system truly dependable? How stable will the new agriculture system be? Stay tuned for additional information on this subject. To begin, let's look at an overview of broke farmers that rely on rubbish technique. The Hoes and Mr. Barbosa support Ernst Gotch's syntropic agriculture system, which has split experts. Various species are planted and developed together in the process, resembling rainforest development. Each plant in the system has a purpose, to shade another or improve soil nutrients. Pruning them back regularly provides biomass to a forest-like floor while also hastening natural succession by making room for the following species. Finally, customers are guaranteed long-term produce, while farmers are promised a cornucopia of robust plots. Mr. Hoes and Mr. Barbosa offer courses through Centropics Down Under and Centropic Solutions, and both think the concept is gaining traction. Centropic Down Under works with around 300 farmers, whereas Centropic Solutions, which introduced the approach to Australia in 2015, holds two courses every two weeks for up to 35 persons. Mr. Hose claims that the payoff is substantial, while diving into the process requires courage. It is expensive to start a firm in the first five years. It's far more expensive to set up a firm that runs itself, he explained. We never believed we make it through the first three years. Now, my wife and I work around 20 to 25 hours weekly on a five-acre farm, and we make more than enough money. The Hose claim to have zero outgoings, with almost everything coming from outside their house. They don't fertilize or spray. They grow anything from lettuce to pawpaws using their inputs. The system has its detractors. Moving on, more specifics on the subject. According to Professor Daniel Rodriguez, a research fellow at the University of Queensland's Center for Crop Science, science has trailed behind tiny groups of farmers' excitement in many of these initiatives. That should be a worry. When some ideas are examined by policy, rapidly ramped up, or promoted as the sole method to generate food, he says. At most, each centropic farmer can feed a handful of families, whereas Australian broadacre farmers feed around 60 million people, Prof Rodriguez told AAP. Australian broadcare farmers have already advanced, effective, and efficient conservation agricultural approaches, according to University of Sydney agricultural chemist Professor Emeritus Les Copeland. Centropic agriculture aims to promote biodiversity and rehabilitate land, both of which are recently goals. However, he stated that it would never be a method of large food production, citing labor as one of the major concerns. Long-term issues such as pests and illnesses, wild animals, and so on, Prof Copeland told AAP. How will these things appear in 10 or 20 years? It is extremely dependent on the specific scenario. According to Mr. Barbosa, large-scale farmers with tens of thousands of acres are willing to investigate Centropic and see how they might work in their situation. Both he and Mr. Ho suggested that large-scale farms can can more easily integrate the system with further technological advancements in equipment. Following that, the first time lapse of a rare moonflower blossoming is breathtaking. A rare Amazonian cactus that blooms just once a year for 12 hours has blossomed successfully in the United Kingdom for the first time, grabbing the interest of hundreds of thousands of people worldwide who watch the event online. The moonflower, Selenocerius witty, is an interesting cactus with a flattened stem that spirals like ribbons around other branches. It grows deep within a small patch of jungle in Brazil and blossoms for only one night each year. Thus, only a few individuals have seen it bloom in the wild. A moonflower flowered at Cambridge University Botanic Garden, CUBG, on February 20th, and the entire process was recorded on film for the first time. According to the BBC, almost 400,000 people watched the webcast on CUBG and YouTube channels. It's been very overwhelming for us, said Alex Summers, the CUBG BG greenhouse supervisor in charge of the moonflower. Growing plants do not receive as much attention and publicity. The flowering gave scientists a rare opportunity to try to pollinate it, which might allow them to grow more of these gorgeous and unusual cacti in the future. Next up, Hawkeye State Harvest ahead of schedule. The previous week, farmers in Iowa could quadruple more than the number of acres of maize and soybeans that they harvested because of the practically ideal weather. As of the 9th of October, the USDA Crop Progress Report indicated that 23% of Iowa's corn had been harvested, which was 4% more than the average over the previous five years. The harvest of soybeans is 55% complete across the state, which is over 20% more than the norm. Rob Ebbold, a farmer who operates in the counties of Scott and Muscatine, has commented, 
so far, it's been a pretty darn nice crop. According to Ewalt, he has already harvested around 35% of his maize and 50% of his soybeans. Given the clear weather conditions, his biggest issue has been maintaining adequate crop moisture. He claims that some of the soybeans and some of the corn took their own sweet time to dry. He also says that part of the maize doesn't seem to want to dry down too fast. Ewald believes that this year's harvest has produced extraordinary yields for him, and he notes that this is the finest crop he has ever had. Moving on, in addition to the early harvest, the power of rain has given a helping hand to the Hawkeye State. Farmer Kelly Nevenhirsch, located close to the Primgar and farms across the state, is only experiencing ordinary yields. Rain is the defining factor. The region around Ewald received about 6 inches more rainfall than the area around Nevenhirsch from May through September. Nevenhirsch even detects a difference in yield between areas that received more rain than others. Other fields received less rainfall. According to him, the impact that the additional 2 or 3 inches created during the growing season was worlds of a difference. The United States Drought Monitor reports that more than 26% of O'Brien County is now experiencing extreme drought at the D3 level. The entire county is experiencing drought conditions of varying severity. According to Nevenhirsch, the moisture kept in the soil was beneficial to his crop this year, but he will require far more rain next year. In addition to the dry weather, Nevenhirsch has to deal with gusts that make the possibility of a fire much greater. He claims that there have been several field fires in his region, and the case of fire has slowed down the process of harvesting his crops. Despite the difficulties, he anticipates finishing the harvest earlier this year. The harvesting of his soybeans is complete, and he estimates that the harvesting of his corn will be finished within the next 7 to 10 days. It all just depends on how many days there are where it's windy, he explains. Following that, severe drought triggers aid in most of Kansas and half of Missouri. The drought conditions in almost the entire state of Kansas and nearly half the state of Missouri are severe enough to trigger a federal program intended to help ranchers who have lost grazing acres for their herds. This program will assist in the number of millions of dollars. 85 of Kansas's 105 counties have been deemed eligible for the Livestock Forage Program offered by the United States Department of Agriculture. This program provides financial help to ranchers experiencing severe, extreme, or exceptional drought conditions. As of the previous week, 47 counties in Missouri were qualified for the program. In addition to the majority of the United States, Kansas, and Missouri are suffering from a protracted drought which the governors of both states have deemed an emergency situation. The majority of southern Kansas is experiencing either exceptional or extreme drought. Rancher and Kansas Farm Service Agency State Executive Director Dennis McKinney remarked, Every day you go out, and within five minutes, your ears, nose, and mouth are full of dust. It simply becomes extremely disheartening. There have been many months of drought in Kansas. The Livestock Forage Program has been implemented in certain counties for nearly a decade. According to an executive order signed by Governor Laura Kelly. All 105 counties are either on a drought watch, warning, or emergency status due to the ongoing drought. Finally, counties eligible for livestock assistance. A USDA program that provides drought relief to farmers and ranchers in 80 of Kansas' 105 counties has been active and has paid out $47 million this year. In 2021, the program gave out only $1 million. Drought conditions prompted Missouri Gov Mike Parson to establish a drought alert in 53 Missouri counties. South South of the Missouri River this July. 40 counties became eligible for the USDA program this summer in only a few weeks. Another group of people joined them early this month. According to McKinney, the Kansas agency finished its fiscal year last month, processing over 7,700 petitions for assistance, totaling more than $45 million. The monetary aid enables ranchers whose grasses have dried up to buy hay for their cows or leasing grazing grounds. According to McKinney, only the northwest region of the state had severe drought the previous year. In a typical year, his agency handles less than 1,000 cases, totaling less than $1 million. Well, that that marks the end of our video for today. We hope you enjoyed it. On your way out, make sure to hit that subscribe button for more content like this in the future. Thanks for watching.